the fall of 1871 in northeastern Wisconsin. A fire breaks out in the town of Peshtigo. It spreads from one county to the next, destroying a million acres of land in its path. In the town of Robinsonville, people watch in horror as the sea of flames engulfs their homes. desperation, they gather what little they can and head in the direction of a chapel where they believe their last hope lies. It's August 15th, 2009. For Catholics, it's the day they celebrate what is called the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which recalls that Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, was assumed body and soul into heaven. 2009 marks the 150th anniversary of a chapel called Our Lady of Good Help. Thousands gather amongst fields and farms where the chapel resides. Yet, why has this particular place brought all these people together? What is the significance of the 150 years? Throughout the course of the next half hour, you will learn what exactly happened at this place that made it such an historic landmark in Wisconsin and why so many people continue to come back every year. By the year 1853, Wisconsin was host to a large body of immigrants from Belgium, where our story begins. In Belgium, there lived 22-year-old Adele Bryce. Born on January 30, 1831, little is known of her childhood, only that she had little education and, by accident, lost sight in one of her eyes. She was well known for her simple religious ways. It was said that at a very young age, Adele made a promise to the Virgin Mary that when she grew up, she was going to become a religious and dedicate her life to the foreign missions. And they had vowed that when they grew up, they were going to join a convent and do work in the foreign missions. That was their goal at that very young age of First Communion. But her plans were about to take a turn. In 1855, Adele discovered that her parents were planning to emigrate to the United States in search of greener pastures. Adele was reluctant to go and discussed the dilemma with her confessor. And Adele was torn. She didn't know what to do. She really wanted to stay in Belgium and, and join that convent and work in the foreign missions. She was concerned. She went to her parish priest. He told her to do as her parents wished and, quote, if God wills it, you will become a sister in America. Adele obeyed and went to America, not knowing what lay ahead. The Bryce family left Belgium on June 9, 1855, and two months later, arrived in Red River, Wisconsin. They purchased some 240 acres of land and began their life in the New World. Life was hard for the average pioneer. Work was plentiful, and money was scarce. Life was difficult. This was all wooded territory. When the settlers first got here, they had to you know, struggle to clear land. To just eke out a living and to survive over the winter was a constant struggle. Many people died during the winter and did not survive those first years when they moved here. Adele shared the burden with her family by working in the fields, carrying grain to the grist mill miles away and preparing shingles for market. Four years after Adele arrived in Wisconsin, she would experience the event that ultimately changed her life. Adele was on her way to the grist mill with a sack of grain to be ground for wheat and she was traveling through this very site and it was just an Indian trail, all wooded, but she got to this site and all of a sudden this beautiful lady in white appeared but didn't say anything and she stood between a maple and a hemlock tree is what Adele described as where the lady stood. So Adele startled, the lady appeared, then disappeared, and Adele kept on her way to the grist mill and went home. When she related her experience to her parents, they presumed to think it a lost soul in need of prayers. Well, it was that following Sunday, on October 9th, 1859, 
and Adele was on her way to church that morning with her sister Isabel and a neighbor lady, and she got to this spot again. And again, between that same maple and hemlock tree, the beautiful lady in white appeared again. Adele was a little frightened and concerned, and the three ladies continued on their way to church. So Adele, again, like she did back in Belgium, went to her, the priest after Mass and said, Father, this happened to me twice now. I don't know what to make of this. What should I do? So the priest counseled her and said, I want you to go back that same way. But this time if the lady appears, I want you to say, in God's name, who are you and what do you want of me? So Adele now felt empowered like, I have a mission now, I know what to do. So they came back on their route home from church and they got to this spot again. And between the maple and the hemlock tree, the lady appeared. Now I always like to read the direct quote from the chapel history book, which I am holding. And this gives you the exact exchange in what happened. And I don't like to miss any of it. And so pardon me for reading it. But they got to this spot. And when the lady appeared, Adele said, In God's name, who are you and what do you want of me? Asked Adele as she had been directed. I am the Queen of Heaven who prays for the conversion of sinners. And I wish you to do the same. You received Holy Communion this morning, and that is well, but you must do more. Make a general confession and offer communion for the conversion of sinners. If they do not convert and do penance, my son will be obliged to punish them. Adele, who is it? said one of the women. Oh, why can't we see her as you do? said another weeping. Kneel, said Adele. The lady said she's the Queen of Heaven. Our blessed lady turned, looked kindly at them and said, Blessed are they that believe without seeing. What are you doing here in idleness, continued Our Lady, while your companions are working in the vineyard of my son? What more can I do, dear lady, said Adele weeping. Gather the children in this wild country and teach them what they should know for salvation. But how shall I teach them who know so little myself, replied Adele. Teach them, replied her radiant visitor, their catechism, how to sign themselves with the sign of the cross and how to approach the sacraments. That is what I wish you to do. Go and fear nothing. I will help you. And with that, the lady vanished. So that is the whole exchange and the whole mission that the Blessed Mother set her feet down here to give to Adele. One other important point I think that is, is um, cute in this exchange is she said, what are you doing here in idleness while your companions are working in the vineyard of my son? Well, poor Adele left her friends back in Belgium who had joined convents and were working in the foreign missions and were doing the work of her son and our blessed lady is saying to her, Adele, get busy. People are losing your faith all around you here. This is your mission territory. Word spread quickly of Adele's encounter with the Virgin Mary and many, for the most part, believed her. Right after the apparition, Adele's father built a little, what's similar to a little roadside chapel, an 8x12 little chapel, right next to the apparition spot, just to kind of mark it so people would know when they came here this was the spot. As news of the apparition spread, the number of people who came to the little chapel increased. You're wondering, well, nothing was here at the time. It was just a wooded Indian trail. How was Adele going to fulfill that mission? She spent the first two years of this mission of hers walking in a 50-mile radius of this particular spot. Going from home to home, knocking on doors, saying, please, let me do all your household work. In exchange, just let me teach your children their catechism. That is how important this mission was to Adele 
that she would wear herself out going from home to home doing all of this work just for the privilege of being able to teach the children their catechism. She was unwavering in devotion to her duty. No force of nature could keep her from accomplishing her task. It was actually two years later, in 1861, that the neighboring farmers got together with Adele's father, Lambert Bryce, and they built a larger wooden church. With the success of Adele's work, the newly appointed pastor of the Belgian colony, Reverend Philip Crudd, encouraged Adele to go farther in her work by having others join in her labors. He also suggested building a school and a convent so that the children could come to her for instruction. Well, if you can imagine two years of going from home to home, doing all this household work and teaching the children, it was taking its toll on Adele, and I think people could start to realize that. So the people that owned this land, this special spot where the Blessed Mother had sat down, donated it to Adele so that she could build the first boarding school here. To raise money to build the school, Adele undertook what was called a begging tour, going from community to community, asking for donations. Adele was successful in her efforts and the school was established by 1868. It had over 60 children enrolled. Tuition was one dollar a week, but that was never enough to cover provisions for all who resided there. Adele would often go on begging tours for vegetables, grain, and meat. When she could not provide enough, Adele would often pray to the Virgin Mary for help, to which she always responded. Inside the school, lessons were taught in both French and English, and the children in general were bright, and many were advanced in their studies. It is clear that Adele and her companions worked unselfishly to provide the right atmosphere for the children in their care. However great their responsibility was, it must be understood that Adele and the other sisters did not belong to any official order or congregation. They wore traditional religious garb, retained their property and independence, and took no vows. This ultimately meant that they could leave any time they wished. Like Adele, many devoted their lives to their work. The sisters were often called different names. The Sisters of Good Health, the Sisters of Good Help, and the Sisters of St. Francis of Assisi. The school, which they ran, was acknowledged as the second academy in the Green Bay Diocese. In 1871, one of the greatest natural disasters in the history of the United States took place. It began with an exceedingly dry winter and summer. Most of the rivers and streams had dried up, and to make matters worse, men were starting fires to clear land. On the night of October 8, 1871, strong winds swept through Wisconsin and fanned these small fires. And it was a very dry year. There were little fires burning everywhere. It was incredibly dry. And that night of October 8th, the winds picked up from the south and this hurricane of winds came and it ignited every little fire that was burning anywhere into this great inferno known as the Pestigo Fire. The fire spread from county to county, destroying everything in its path. 240 miles away, another city was facing the same severity of the great winds and the city was Chicago. While the Great Chicago Fire was underway, killing approximately 250 people, the Peshtigo Fire was consuming northeastern Wisconsin, and the Chapel of Our Lady of Good Help stood directly in its path. As the fire neared the town of Robinsonville, people sought refuge at the chapel, believing that the Virgin Mary would protect them. They fled with everything they could take with them, their livestock and anything they could carry on their backs. And when they got here, they found Adele and the school children already in the church praying, beseeching the Blessed Mother for her help and protection. An excerpt from Father Pernan of Peshtigo. Filled with confidence, they entered the chapel, reverently raised the statue of Mary, and kneeling, bore it in procession around their beloved sanctuary. And they were on their knees that whole night around the grounds. And it said when wind and flames and fire consumed them in one direction, they would just turn and continue in another direction, but they never gave up. 
such a testimony to the power of the rosary and, and their dedication and, and their beseeching the Blessed Mother for help. What transpired afterwards can only be described as a miracle. When the people found their prayers answered in the form of a downpour that ultimately extinguished the fire. This is the morning of October 9th, the day the Blessed Mother had appeared here. The rains came, extinguished the flames, and when dawn broke that next morning, all those people that were here that night witnessed the miracle of what had happened because as far as you could see in any direction around this five and a half acre spot was nothing but ashes. And the historical accounts say that this shone like an emerald green island in a sea of ashes. Nothing on this ground was touched by the fire. The outside of the fence posts were charred. The insides were never touched. And everything on this grounds at that time were wooden buildings. It was still a wooden church at that time and a wooden school. And with the history accounts of, of how hot that fire was, they would have just incinerated just by the fire coming that close to them. What would later be known as the Peshtigo Fire would claim between 1,200 to 2,400 lives and destroy 1.5 million acres of land. Well, the Peshtigo Fire, if you read your history books, is still to this day the most devastating fire in U.S. history. It consumed more acres of land and killed more people than any other fire in our history. Is it still just a coincidence? Or did Mary try to warn Adele all those years earlier when she stated, if they do not convert and do penance, my son will be obliged to punish them? We may never know, but what we do know is that after this catastrophe took place, many who had doubted the validity of the apparitions came to believe Adele's story. The night of the Peshtigo fire was all the proof pioneers would need that Mary had once visited Adele. Throughout the chapel's 150 years, there have been numerous reports of miraculous events that cannot be scientifically or medically explained. Some individuals have come forward to tell their own personal stories of what they can only describe as a miracle. I found out in uh, June 1997 that I found out that I did have ovarian cancer. After every treatment, my husband would help would take me and bring me here to the chapel. And we'd come down and we'd see the rosary to the Blessed Mother. And the very last time my husband was driving me here, it was in January, and it was about 30 below zero. And it was cold, and we were just coming up to the driveway of the chapel. And as he was broaching the driveway, he said to me, Martha, he says, look at the huge, beautiful rainbow. But we realized that that was a sign that I was going to be okay. In 1951, when my dad was 10, he was in a childhood accident. Uh, one kid threw a piece of ice at him and it hit him in his uh, right eye. And it was a, a puncture wound. And in those days, they took the eye out when, when something bad happened to it. Very shortly after, a disease that his other eye got, his left eye, it's called sympathetic ophthalmia, and that eye started to self-destruct. Most people go blind. When this was all happening at home, my grandma, who was a very faithful woman, her name was Genevieve, she came here, she was Belgian, so she knew all about the shrine here, and she uh, asked Our Lady if she would heal my dad. My dad's name is Dennis. And she said, if you'll heal Dennis, I will come here every single year until I die on the Feast of the Assumption. And that's what she did. And Mary did heal my father's eyesight. Those who were miraculously healed of their lameness have left behind their crutches, which now lay in the crypt of the chapel. My dad told me one time that uh, Henry, who was on crutches and was living upstairs at my dad's mother's home because he couldn't work, walked out on his crutches to the church at Robinsonville from Green Bay. Well, that's quite a walk. And he walked out there and uh, he was a very religious person. And he left Robinsonville without his crutches. And my dad used to show them to me when we were out there. He said, these are your Uncle Henry's crutches. He walked out here and he left them here. 
A lot of people ask, you know, have, have things happened here? You know, what kind of incredible things happened here? And I said, you know, it's, it's too numerous to tell you. I mean, being here for 17 years and hearing the stories of people and all of the answered prayers. There have been other reports that have been in circulation for some years. One involved a hard of hearing man who reportedly was able to hear after saying the rosary at the chapel one afternoon. After that day, he had no need for his hearing aid. Another instance involved a woman who brought her blind child to the chapel. When the two left, the child was pointing in all directions, yelling, Mama, look, the child could see. While there is a sense that miracles have taken place, none have been investigated by the Catholic Church to determine whether an actual miracle did occur. If we think of, of these extraordinary happenings or, or phenomena, the church always takes uh, a position of caution because the church is always at the service of the truth and wants to lead people into the truth of Jesus Christ. Uh, the church wants to avoid any misunderstandings uh, or other things that, that might distort the faith. And so there needs to be a time uh, of testing uh, a, a time of prayer, uh, a time of discernment to determine whether this is authentic or not. Many deemed an investigation unnecessary, for their witness to the experience was enough proof for them that the chapel was indeed a holy place. And I feel that the doctors did what they could, but I feel like by praying to the Blessed Mother and asking for help, and believing that that is what made me be still be here. I think we, we can look to them to, to record uh, the importance of the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help as a place of prayer and devotion where people have sought the Lord's help in their, their time of great need and suffering. And we can see in this also signs of the Lord's great compassion to reach out and touch people uh, through the intercession of His Blessed Mother. Even though we have no official or, or clear declaration as to exactly what these events have been, they have been meaningful in the hearts of the people and have helped them grow closer to Christ and trust ever more in His compassion and His mercy and His care for them. Within 10 years of the Peshtigo fire, many changes were being set in motion. Due to the impact Our Lady of Good Help had on the community, it was evident that the need for new buildings was stronger than ever. Financial contributions by Bishop Krautbauer and Father Fox, the future Bishop of Green Bay, sealed the deal to have a new brick chapel built. Work began in 1880 on the new brick structure, and in 1885, Bishop Krautbauer approved the first brick shrine. A schoolhouse would later be built to accommodate more than 100 children a year. When that was built, Adele was still alive. And so nobody knew it, but they cut down those two trees and they built the sanctuary of that 1880 chapel right over the spot of the apparition so that that altar and that sanctuary could be right over the spot where the Blessed Mother had appeared. Well, when Bishop Rohde decided that chapel wasn't big enough, and in 1941 they commissioned the building of this particular chapel, nobody was still here from 1880 that knew that that was what happened. And it wasn't until they were taking down the 1880 chapel to build this current chapel building that they found preserved under the floor of the sanctuary, the two stumps of the trees and the site of the apparition. So to this day, this particular chapel was designed with an area we call the crypt because it preserves that spot, that spot where they found those two stumps of the trees. So not only do we have a beautiful sanctuary here in our upper church, but we have a beautiful crypt with a statue of Mary on that spot where those two stumps of trees were found under the 1880 chapel. And there's always hundreds of candles burning around it at any time, which are lit by people who come here beseeching the intercession of the Blessed Mother. The 
the very beginning, Adele took on much to do the work that she believed Mary had commissioned of her. She faced ridicule and doubt by many along the way, some things she had no control over, and problems were often caused by misconceptions. One instance took place at the Feast of the Assumption, where the gathering had attracted beer vendors and others seeking to exploit those who had come in faith to observe the religious event. This had cast a bad light on the religious community, the chapel, and even Adele herself. Because of this, the truths about her stories of the apparitions were coming under scrutiny. Initially, some of the accounts of the apparitions uh, of our Blessed Mother to Adele met with resistance and questioning by priests and other authorities in the church. And this is not unusual. Reports reached Bishop Melcher, who did not have the opportunity to observe Adele or her work. The bishop directed the chapel be closed and the keys given to him. Adele was ordered to stop speaking about the apparitions. Adele was at all times as obedient as she was when she came to America with her parents. After the chapel was closed, Adele gave the keys to Bishop Melcher and reminded him of his responsibility for the souls that would be lost due to the lack of instruction. The bishop was so impressed by her zeal and sincerity that he returned the keys to her and encouraged her to continue her good work. Though Adele met every challenge that came her way, some would take a harder toll during her final years. The school, where she was responsible for over a hundred children, would soon be under an epidemic of croup claiming the lives of two children. Adele had the misfortune to notify the parents and send the remaining children home. Not all would come back. The parents were worried about the health of their children. Just when things couldn't get worse, another blow fell hard on Adele. She would lose one of her closest companions, Sister Maggie, leaving the chapel under a dark cloud. Not long after the death of Sister Maggie, Adele had to appoint a new successor to manage the school. She appointed a younger sister who had previously been a student. That angered older sisters who had been there longer. All at once, half the sisters left the chapel. Adele found herself in a predicament that she did not anticipate. She carried on the best she could. Adele died on July 5, 1896. She was 66 years old. Her last words were to her former student, Josie, be kind to the sick and the old and continue to instruct the children in their religion, as I have done. Adele was buried beside her beloved shrine. Engraved on her tombstone is a saying in French, which, translated, says, Sacred Cross, under thy shadow, I rest and hope. With the death of Adele, the future of the chapel was uncertain. And after her death, the, the Bay Settlement sisters were sent here to take over the school that Adele had started. And Mother Frances entrusted Sister Pauline, then stationed at Delwich, Wisconsin, with this mission. She arrived October 28, 1902, to find two sisters, 20 children, and 42 cents. Determination and faith in the divine providence, Sister Pauline continued her work on preserving the chapel until her death, March 15th, 1926. So at that point in time, the buildings were converted by the Green Bay Diocese to a home for crippled children. And it was used for over 20 years as a, a place for crippled children to come and be taught and instructed. Over the last 150 years, thousands have visited the shrine, and it is expected that those numbers will continue to rise over the years. Today, the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help is a vibrant place of prayer and pilgrimage and its mission is fostered by the Bishop of Green Bay. Nonetheless, there has not been a formal declaration regarding the apparitions, which are still under investigation. What we were able to gain from the story of the shrine is the overall impact it has had on nearly everyone who has been fortunate enough to visit it. Some found prayers answered and illnesses healed. Others simply found a place of retreat where they could find comfort and solitude among farmlands and fields. One thing just kind of rings true is that everybody's experience here at the Shrine is unique to that person. It's for what they needed at that point in their life and what our Blessed Mother knew would touch their heart. 
Every, every experience is different. And it's just a wonderful spot to have an apparition site, a place where Mary has been here on Earth. It just seems like a very sacred, holy place. You just come here and it's very, uh, it's very peaceful. It's a good experience. You know, if ever I need a place to go, I need to pray and think about things, this is just the perfect place for it. We were also able to learn about the life of a courageous young woman who, through means beyond her dreams, would find that her wishes had come true in the most unimaginable way possible. It is indeed a great honor to be here this morning and to be able to make a special proclamation, a proclamation that in one way could be considered to be evolving for many, many years. This apparition site having been begun in 151 years ago and today receiving full approbation of the church. which uh, lists the reasons for this decision and also to now officially proclaim it here before all of you gathered here this morning who have had so much connection through your ancestors and yourselves to this beautiful shrine and to those who are listening by radio or watching by television that you too may be connected in a special way to this important event. Given that for over 151 years, a continuous flow of the faithful has come to champion Wisconsin to pray, to seek solace and comfort in times of trouble, and to petition our Lord Jesus Christ through the powerful intercession to Our Lady of Good Help. Given that incessant prayer has gone up in this place, based upon the word of a young Belgian immigrant woman, Adele Bryce, who in October 1859 said that the Blessed Mother, a lady clothed in dazzling white, had appeared to her on this side. The lady was elevated slightly in a bright light and gave words of solace and comfort and a bold and challenging mission for the young immigrant woman. The lady gave her a twofold mission of prayer for the conversion of sinners and catechesis. Quote, I am the Queen of Heaven who prays for the conversion of sinners and I wish you to do the same, she said to Adele. You received Holy Communion this morning and that as well, but you must do more. Make a general confession and offer communion for the conversion of sinners. Gather the children in this wild country and teach them what they should know for salvation. Teach them their catechism, how to sign themselves with the sign of the cross, <coughs> and how to approach the sacraments. That is what I wish you to do. Go and fear nothing. I will help you. Adele Bryce began immediately to fulfill the mandate and mission entrusted to her by the lady, and oftentimes at great personal sacrifice, went to the homes of the children to instruct them in the largely unsettled and forested area in Wisconsin. Adele was ever obedient to the authorities of the church and steadfast in the mission entrusted to her by Our Lady no matter what difficulty she encountered. The mission given her became such a commitment that she set up a Catholic school of instruction for children here and even began a community of third order Franciscan women who assisted her in her obedience to the mandate of Our Lady to pray for the conversion of sinners and to instruct the children. A long tradition of oral and some documented sources Recounting answered prayers at the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Health include conversions and many physical healings attributed to the Blessed Mother's intercession. Many physical healings are memorialized by the multitude of crutches and other mementos of thanksgiving 
or answered prayers left at the shrine. <coughs> prayers for physical healing are answered even to this day through the intercession of Our Lady of Good Health. Though none of these favors have been officially declared a miracle by the Church, they are clear evidence of spiritual fruitfulness and the history of devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary at the shrine. This holy place was preserved from the infamous Peshtigo fire of 1871, when many of the faithful gathered here with Adele and prayed through the intercession of Our Lady of Good Health, with the result that the fire that devastated everything in its wake in this entire area stopped when it reached the parameters of this shrine. There is a clear testimony to the upright character of Adele Bryce. Her devotion to Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary, and her unwavering commitment to the mission Mary entrusted to her. Moreover, the uninterrupted history of faith and devotion testifies to the spiritual fruits bestowed upon the pilgrims to this shrine. Given all of the above, I ask three Marian experts to study the history of this alleged apparition and all of the extant documents, letters, and written testimonies in order to determine whether or not there are inherent contradictions or objections to the veracity of the testimony given by Adele Bryce with regard to the events of 1859 and to establish whether or not there is enough evidence to suggest that the events which happened to Adele Bryce may be of a supernatural origin. There is nothing in the person and character of Adele Bryce that would make us question the veracity of the substance of her account. In fact, her personal character is a major factor in favor of the recognition of the apparition. Objections concerning whether there was enough evidence to support a judgment in favor of the supernatural character of the events were thoroughly investigated and answered by the experts. One of the experts affirmed that any lack of information does not invalidate, quote, the overall impression of coherence between the event and the consequences, the personality of the seer and commitment to the mission received, the comparability between this event and similar recognized apparitions, and challenges of the historical context and responses given. Therefore, it remains to me now, the 12th Bishop of the Diocese of Green Bay, and the lowliest of the servants of Mary and Jesus, to declare with moral certainty and in accord with the norms of the Church that the events, apparitions, and locutions given to Adele Bryce in October of 1859 do exhibit the substance of supernatural character, and I do hereby approve these apparitions as worthy of belief, belief although not obligatory, by the Christian faith. I encourage the faithful to frequent this holy place as a place of solace and answered prayer. <coughs> this document given at the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Health, Champion, Wisconsin, the eighth day of December in the year of our Lord, 2010, the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. David L. Ricken, 12th Bishop of the Diocese of Green Bay, John F. Dirkler, Chancellor. Let's thank the Blessed Mother.